the 70s and stuff like that, it, the Bronx was like a third world country. And uh, nobody ever wanted to come into the Bronx because they thought they would never make it out. At the time, um, in that era of the Bronx, uh, the 70s and stuff like that, it was a lot of abandoned buildings. It was poverty. It was considered the ghetto. And growing up in the Bronx, to me, um, my mom had 11 kids and she was a single parent. It was so much richness in the Bronx, but even though it, nobody was rich there, we didn't have money and it was poverty, it was so much of a culture richness. And um, hip hop, um, growing up in the Bronx was like, you just, it was just what you was born and raised in. So it was nothing shocking and you just, you know, it was like, you grew up in the hood, you grew up in the ghetto, and, and the people in the ghetto and all, everybody wasn't sad or, or unhappy. Everybody was just making the best way they can. And, and at, you know, my mom had 11 miles to feed and she was a single parent and we lived from pillow to post, but we never, it never coming up was like, we was sad and, you know, nothing like that. It really was just made us strong. Cause you know, my mom used to be like, don't cry no matter what. It was not about crying and it was not about the problem. It was like, it's survival mode. What was the solution? And so the Bronx kind of had that vibe, like everybody was doing what they had to do to make it work. As far as society was beating the Bronx down a lot, you know, criminal justice, but it was so much richness that rose this dude growing the crack of the hood. So much richness came out of it, which was hip hop. And when hip hop came out, um, we was just doing it. Well, I know Mercedes ladies, we like, I used to run away from home because that was how I was escaping all the pressures at home. And I used to take to the streets. And then I used to see like Grandmaster Flash and and and, and um, Cool Herc and all of them on the corner. And so the corner, everybody, that's where the setup was. Wasn't no stages, wasn't no nothing. It was the corners, the corner of Boston Road. It was, it was Cedar Park. Everybody set up their equipment and then you find somebody DJing and rapping. So me and um, three other girls used to go up there and I used to go way up there because I knew my mother wouldn't come out and look for me because she had too many kids at home. So when I used to get home, I used to wait for the beatings, but the love of hip hop outweighed the pain of the beatings. Like, okay, like I just got so used to it, but I back out there again. At that time, it was Shy Rock, and she was the first female uh, MC in the Bronx, and she was um, with the um, funky, you probably know, with the funky four plus one, and DJ Breakout and the Uptown Crew. So she was the female for them. We had MC Smiley, who was the female MC for the L Brothers, Theodore and them. Um, and so you had females like that that was part of a male group. And what myself, R.D. Smiley, Tracy T, and Little Bit, we went up there and we used to be out there and we used to be like, we should start our own crew. Why is it not all female crew? You know, and that was our, we was only like 15, 14. And we was like, we're gonna start our own crew and we're gonna go up against the guys. And that was our attitude. And so what we did was, um, was sat up there and was trying to think of a name. So we said we wanted a name that was powerful, that, you know, it wasn't gonna be looked at as always oh, some black young girls from the hood, you know, and the stereotypical thing about us from the hood. We wanted to be, even though we came from the hood, we wanted a classy name. So we was trying to think of things. So Mercedes, we thought of cars, an expensive car, and Mercedes came up. And so from that, we was like, that's it, Mercedes young ladies, that's it. And that that's how we came up with the name. And we started printing up, we used to get the sweatshirts and print like Velcro letter on it that said Mercedes Young Ladies. And we used to have our jeans on. So it was four and then we started recruiting other girls. So then at that time we would just walk through the hood with our sweatshirts on and everybody be out there with guys doing their stuff. And it's like Mercedes ladies, you know, but they just thought we was just a female crew. We was just coming, but then our name started getting popular. So if you listen to some of their raps, uh, in my Mercedes, young ladies, 
Then you have the Furious Five, and then they say, Mercedes. If you listen to their rap back there, you'll hear Mercedes Ladies. And that's when our names started getting popular. And then um, the L Brothers had a manager, um, Trevor, and he approached, because our name was getting to be so dope and hot. We was hood famous. <laughs> and so he said, um, oh, I heard your rap and DJ. And we was like, yeah, we rap and DJ. And actually, RD knew how to mix. We used to play around with rapping, but we didn't never have money to get the equipment. So we said, yeah, we know how to rap. So he says, um, I would like to uh, meet with y'all because I have this female DJ. And um, I, and I'll I'll supply you with the equipment. So we end up going there to where the L brothers just rehearse at theater on them, and um, that's when we met Baby D, and that was the DJ he had for her, for us to meet. And she clicked with us. Um, MC Smiley at the time was their um, MC, and he was trying to get her to join Mercedes Ladies but she didn't want to be in an all-female crew, which was understandable. She's with the L Brothers. So it became R.D. and Baby D was the two DJs. I became an MC, even though I was saying I wanted to be like a manager and overlook the Mercedes ladies since MC Smiley didn't want to do it. They said, sure, you're going to be the MC. So I became an MC and then we um, had um, Tracy T and we recruited Zena Z and Eva Def, who was from around my block. So that's how the beginning of Mercedes Ladies. And we used to rehearse at the same place that L Brothers did. And Trevor um, Action and Action was, was a roster crew. He, they are the ones that said, okay, we're gonna get the equipment for y'all. So we had our debut, they put the flyers out and we was rehearsing every day and every night. Mind you, I was coming home, getting a whipping from my mom and still going back out there and I had to go to this rehearsal. And so our debut is um, 63 Park. And that was on Boston Road, and I told you that's where everybody used to be on the corners and doing their thing. Boston Road, 63 Park wasn't a park, it actually was the back of the schoolyard. And that, that was our first debut. And when we went up there, and we we just rocked it, and people, it, it was a lot of people out there, because it was like, okay, we gotta see this old female DJ rap group, because the hype was up, because Trevor put out flyers. So we had a pack there because people wanted to see, okay, let's see this. And we just blew it off the park. And actually, in the middle of rapping and all that, it was a shootout going on and we still, we still was, that's how the Bronx is. That's how we were back then. We still was making our way that day. And that was the beginning and the birth of Mercedes. Us four that started it, me and RD was best friends and I met Tracy and a little bit was, so we're, us four is the one that actually started the group. And we all had the same type of background. Um, we all lived in the hood. Um, Tracy lived on in the Webster Projects. So did R.D. Smiley in the Webster Project. I, I I lived on on Garden Street. I lived in uh, Rip Park Tower. So we was all from the South Bronx. We all was from thing and we had something in common. We all came from single parent homes and we all liked to hang in the street. And um, we just we had, went out there and was watching God. We loved hip hop. We used to make sure we on the block. It was the word, oh, what's his name is playing in Cedar Park, or what's his name is playing on Boston Road, let's go up there. And we used to just, after school, and just run up there and go up there, and, and that was our thing. So it was, so for us to be able to, to sit there and have an idea and say, hmm, we should start our own female crew. And when it came together, that it was, we met Baby D, who was actually the baddest DJ female in the Bronx, because she was taught by uh, Theodore, and she was talking about Grandma Squad, so we're talking about Baby D was hands down. And then we had R&D who knew how to um, mix the records. Baby D was fly as scratching and and, 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 all, and R&D knew how to blend the records. So what more can you say? And then we were like, we that, that's the power we felt like. Okay, we getting ready. Now our name is out. Now we have somebody who gave us the equipment and we was out there and we was just ready to take it by storm and the feeling was amazing. My mom was born and raised in Tallahassee, Florida. And she had um, eight brothers and she had a sister. And um, she um, got married and she, at 15, cause she out there in the South was, you know, from she said she, she, they used to have to sit there and 
and scrape um, potatoes in the backyard and the heat and all of that. And, and you know, the racism was to its highest. And my mom was, and her brothers was considered um, mulatto. So they used to get it from both ends. So she decided to move to New York to become a singer. She packed up her bag, left her husband. Well, I guess, you know, he wasn't, he didn't want her to sing. And I guess in that time, men were more, you know, strong and, and they were, you know, you're not gonna sing, you're not gonna. So she left with her four kids and decided to come to New York. The interesting story is that my mom's father, um, his, wait, my mother's father, who's my grandfather, his father was Senator Hodges of Tallahassee, Florida. If you read up on Senator Hodges, him and his wife had slaves. He had two women slaves and um, they couldn't bear kids. So one of the women slaves, which is my great, great grandma, um, became pregnant and she had my grandfather, which is when my mom and us told the story, I think before he passed away, he had called for all of my uncles and them to come to his bedside on, before he was passing away. But they, my father, my grandfather refused. I guess there was the anger that they had to go be put off in the woods and all that to hide because they was his kids. So when my, when um, I found out about the story, me and my cousins and all of us found out the story, I say in my book, wow. And I put in my book, that's kind of ironic that my mom, that my great, great grandfather is a Senator Hodges. And here we are living in the Bronx, struggling and, and scrambling. And I'm, I'm the hip and I'm, I'm the first female with hip hop. But I say something in the Bronx like, cause you know, you hear those stories of, you know, your grandma and everybody telling you stories and you just, so it started just like, you're kidding me, right? And, uh, and so my mother left, came to New York moved here to the Bronx, and then she ended up not becoming a singer, but ended up having all of these children and being a single parent. And when I decided, she thought when I joined hip hop, I was in, joining a gang. And she didn't want me to be out there to be on drugs. And, you know, she was, my mother was very tough because that's the way she was raised. So she had an iron fist and like, she didn't play. I was really the only child that would challenge her. The other, everybody else would be like, and I was like, <laughs> so, um, so that she came to be a singer, but instead of her being a singer, she had these children and um, she passed away. But most thing is that she was so happy that she, me and her, it came a point when me and her relationship dynamic changed because I think she realized what I was doing. And that's the point when we was getting ready to sign with Russell Simmons and he had came to meet my mom. So I think that that part right there is the part when she really started seeing what I was doing in a way, I guess she could have related because she did come here to New York to be a singer, but this is a whole totally different generation of stuff. This is hip hop. Mm -hmm. So she um, started seeing and believing in it and she started actually trying to help out because she was tired of us doing all these shows and not getting paid. And so um, before she passed, she was so great that I finally finished my book and was gonna get published, but you know, by a magazine and published it. And I think that was the most, ah, thing to me that really made my book important because I, I she kept saying before she passed, she says, you gotta tell your story, you gotta tell your journey, it's just, amazing and she said the only one thing i know you got there making me look bad in that book i said mom when i finish my book you're gonna look like a hero trust me so she before she passed she um, had some of my um nieces and nephews and stuff reading her the book so she was very happy so she passed and i was just grateful that i got my book published before she passed away so um that's that's part of the the history of hip hop and the generation of my family from the South. (laughs) 
soul music and all of that was just roots that we grew up in and then but we was bringing it in another way where we would actually get a beat and we talk about what we was going through in our hood but it, it didn't sound sad it was just telling you about the real grind and the real struggle so it was almost like a poetic thing but it was more of us that was our way of telling our story from our generation being part of hip-hop and then not knowing what I was doing and not knowing by starting an all-female crew that I was making history. We didn't know where it was gonna go, but it was the power because we was hood famous and it was the power because we was females and we was going up against an all-male arena. So that we was, we felt powerful. We walked with our heads up high. You know, we never got a dime or got paid, but we used to walk with our head, our sweatshirts. When you seen us coming down the street, oh, Mercedes, young ladies, it was just, we had our little style and swagger. And that made us feel important. And that was happiness to us. That we was we was going to get we was getting on the mic and going against the men. That was that was our that was my happiness. You know, and so I my concentration actually became into hip hop. It wasn't into and to be honest, I think about it like what did I think I was gonna be? <laughs> Cause we was just doing this hip hop and I think um when us the rest of the girls we used to talk and so we used to say, Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna eventually make some money. We're gonna open up a club. And it's gonna be called the Mercedes Club, and we're gonna promote parties. And this was what we was thinking to do. As you know, this was what our plans was to do. We didn't know where hip hop was gonna go, but we used to get out there and hit the mics and turntables and and go right up against these guys. And you know, I guess in a way, when I think about it, my mom, she probably seen a lot of me in her. And I think that's why I was riding because she came here with a dream to be a singer and get out of the South and get out of the racism and come here to New York and be a singer. And I think she's seen that drive in me, but she, I guess that's why she was hard on me, but she didn't understand what hip hop was. She just thought I was out there in the streets and I guess you know, she was like, she didn't want me to turn out to be on drugs and pregnant and all that. I guess she was trying to protect me, but she got to know that my drive was probably just as much as hers. And if by her moving here, she created history through her children. When I used to go to school, you had the, mostly all the guys used to have the boom box. So when you get on the bus to go to school, somebody had their boom box and it was playing and you hear, you hear, uh, Grandmaster flashing them on the, on the cassette tapes in the boombox, and you would hear um, Cool Herc and the, the Herculoids. You know, it was just a vibe. When you go to school, everybody had a boombox. Outside the school, everybody had their boombox. Hip hop was the, was in. Sha Rock had went to the same school I went to, event. So I used to see her in the back of the class writing her rhymes. And I used to think her dope, you know, she was so dope. And, and, and her flow and stuff like that. So it was hip hop was always in the streets and in the school, when you go to school was there, the dudes would be outside with their boom box, the boom box. I even got mm -hmm. a picture in a boom box. So that hip hop was just the vibe. That was the thing at the time. It was like no more, it wasn't rock and you know, it wasn't no more r and being a, this is when hip hop was hip hop. That was our generation when the hip hop. So that's all I knew going to school and coming home was listening to hip hop. If you're living in poverty and you're living in the ghetto and wolves with no meat don't care who their victim is. And so here you are, okay, the blackout, this was just an opportunity for some people that couldn't afford TVs, couldn't afford things, and they and they went for it because you have to think about it. Uh, society, the government and stuff, they, 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 was, they was treating the Bronx like trash. The blackout happened was just like, like a Christmas, like a blessing. I, I hate to say it like that, but people's running and going. I'm not saying what's right, but I'm saying it's like you, you're talking about um a place that um was a lot of struggles and, and struggling and hard to get jobs and people just taken to the streets and you know you had the number runners and drug dealers and this and that. But it was 
you talking about the Bronx, South Bronx, and the, all of the lights and everything go out, and it's an opportunity to go in there and get that TV you've been having, wish you could have had in your home. Just saying. So the vibe there, yeah. You, I mean, I even uh, some of my brothers and them was running up there, running on Fort Road. The whole block, we was just <laughs> waiting for them to come back. To see, to see what they got. It's bad. Oh, God, it's so bad. But it's real. It's just real. It's just what it is. It's real. I'm not going to say the DJ Cruz and all that was out there doing that. Who knows? You know, if people were just going for, like, whatever they get, get sneakers, sneakers, uh, of course, sneakers, uh, hats, shirts, whatever they could get. I don't think it was no particular aim at what to get. It was just... When that light one happened and everything, everybody just went for for whatever. So it wasn't no like, like oh no, oh wow, I'm running up there to get me some speakers. Nah, it was just, it happened and it was unexpectedly happened and everybody just went for it. Yeah. So no, I wouldn't say, I I don't know. I don't. I mean, I, that would be a story you have to ask some of the DJs and stuff. But I didn't never never know that anybody went up there and looted and got the speakers. <laughs> It was times when they would have certain shows and then they said, oh, y'all don't have to bring your equipment or don't worry about it. It's gonna be equipment uh, set there. And then we get there, oh, why y'all didn't bring your own equipment? And we're like, you know, and then we started feeling we was being sabotaged. And then there's, and then some guys didn't want, oh no, y'all, y'all can't touch my, um, didn't want the D, baby D and them to, t- to mess with their turntables. And then um, a lot of times when we would do these parties and we'd be on the flyers. And then when it was time to get paid, the promoter would say, oh, I already paid the guys. And, uh, you know, I got y'all the next time. And we just heard this. Oh, absolutely. It was very much of a struggle. And um, it was a journey and it was a hell of a journey for us um, because we was doing this with no money. You don't know where we was going, but we was determined. And um, it was it was totally a challenge. It was a challenge, very challenging, very very as time went on that's how our Mercedes ladies actually went into three steps Mercedes ladies started was me RD Tracy T and little bit then I included Zena Z and Everdeath and then we met baby D so you talking about we had about eight of us at, at the time um and MC Smiley decided she didn't want to be a, a in a female group, all female group. Then, as time went on, Tracy T, mother, made her get out the group. She used to come get her at rehearsals. You know, like, no, you're not. So she had to leave the group. So then, it was, then, um, as time went on, uh, we met a third DJ, which was with Spain. And um, Baby D had brought her into the group. So we had three DJs. And then, um, who became the MCs was, me, Ebedef, Zena Z. Okay, Tracy left. Then Zena and Evelyn eventually left because it, I'm telling you, it was it was a toll. We used to walk to do shows. We used to have to carry our own equipment. We had no money. We didn't like we we get a Snicker bar and share it. I mean, it was really so. They started so now it was like, who's gonna we gonna replace them with? So then my mom had used to be like, y'all shouldn't co- incorporate singing. And we was like, rappers don't sing. Like, are you kidding? You want us to be a laughing stock singing? Singing, we're not gonna sing. And my mother just said, well, I think you should put singing in there. And we was like, so then my mother wouldn't let my two sisters hang out with me before the youngest ones. Cause she's like, no, she's in the street. She's in the gang. She's a... So when things started turning, and she finally let them join the group. So that's when um, Sweet Pea and Sty Sty came into the group because they were my two sisters and we had to replace them with Everdeath and Zena Z. So that's how, that's when it started taking a turn. And then at that time, um, we started doing a lot of shows and then my mother kept saying we should incorporate singing Boy, did my mother knew what she was talking about, because look what hip hop, isn't that crazy? So we started doing these singing rehearsals and mixing it in with the rap. 
Then we started getting shows. We did um, David Winfield, the, the baseball player. He hired us to do all of his, um, um, he used to have us doing charity shows for his charity. Then we started, then we did the Cami Hall. Then um, we met um, Guy Fisher, who, I don't know if you know about Guy Fisher. He was the uh, biggest kingpin in Harlem. He's the one that brought the Apollo. He used to be partners with Nikki Bonds and they was the big known the gangsters out there. But he decided to come and started managing us, make sure my mother had money um, to make keep a roof over our head. He started buying our outfits and he started introducing us to like Ralph McDaniels, the one the drummer and all that. We used to go up there and so Mercedes ladies was starting to take a turn. And then we started wearing like he would get these fancy outfits for us to wear and stuff and we wear and start doing shows and then we start incorporating singing and then that's we met Sal and I knew Sal because he used to own Disco Fever and Russell Simmons used to go in there and that's when he when Curtis Blow and so I had met them and I was asking them to come on and to you know because that um he had a um Curtis Blow had his record out then so I was saying Sal like you know why don't you y'all get us a record deal and stuff like that. So that's how I started intertwining with Sal and Russell Simmons. And then I, I told them they come up there and talk and meet my mother. And then that's when they came to the house to meet my mother. And that's when Russell said, well, I'm gonna put them in the studio. I'm gonna um, have Larry Smith um, train them on the vocals because we was doing the record, the Can Can, which was the remake of the Pointer Sisters. So that's when our rapping started slowly turning into singing. And then now this is the second half of the Mercedes ladies. This is the second part of Mercedes ladies. I'm talking about this is all through the early 80s. Um, La Spank had dropped out. Uh, she was with us for like the third DJ. She dropped out, but she was with us for like maybe seven months because she went to, and started her, to get her own female DJ crew from Queens. There were some girls from Queens. So she went to start her own group. So she had dropped out. So who was left was me, Stein, Pam, R.D. Smiley, and Baby D. So we were the group left that, and that's when it started turning into singing. And then we did that, uh, recorded a song, Don's Groove with Donald D. He was the one that discovered SWB and stuff, but he was real dope in Harlem. Um, him and B-Facts, that's B-Facts' brother. And that record that's still playing today, Come on to Don. That record that's playing today, that's Donald D and Mercedes Ladies. I got paid for the song, but well, you know, our name is somewhere on the credit, but yeah. So it started taking a toll, but after all of this and everything, it took a toll, but I just always kept a journey, like a diary, and I would just write things down. Always writing stuff down. Rhymes and writing stuff down. And um, I said, you know, when the group was like tired and everybody's like, nah, I'm done with the hip hop, I, I can't no more. And I got it, because it, it was, and um, that's when hip hop started really going mainstream. And I think that's what made the females was really kind of fed up because we put a lot of work and grind into it and then it's going mainstream. And at that time, um, that's when Sylvia Robinson had started her label. And then she went to South Carolina and, and got Sequence, which was a, a singing group and brought them to New York and had them do a hip hop record tell us that at that time was an insult. And so the girls was like, I'm done. You know, so it was, it just, it just took its toll. When DMC and them, they was from Queens. Um, um, from the Bronx, uh, yeah, Grandmaster Flash um, and Furious Five um, um, came out. Um, Kaz started writing for Sylvia. Um, Grandmaster Kraz, and um, she, her and her husband was in the music industry, but so they decided to, to start this label, and I guess get the hip hop for their label, and I think the whole thing was, they were signing people, but they were signing people that was not, just at our, our family at the time, was not from the grind and the struggle that we did. Like, in our mind, and no, and we were speaking about it, how we're the first all-female DJ rap group in hip-hop history, 
you're gonna go and bring a group from the south and and they become the first females on rat on on wax and so it was a lot of it was a lot of and what i thought our perspective at the time oh yeah mercedes said we were very angry and upset about it we were it, it just was like and and that's when it started being like the girls like okay i'm done i'm done and 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 i think a lot of times we was watching certain things and hip hop being talked about and it was mostly concentrated on the men in hip hop not on the females in the hip hop and that's why it is so crazy um i had set quotes in my book i said whoever was first will be last and whoever was last will be first and when i said that is because i meant that it was all the stories of the men in in the bronx and the hip hop nobody was talking about the females you have some that was mentioned oh yeah mercedes ladies they were the females out there it was never really nothing focused on us and i that's why i really put my drive into doing this book and and doing this because now it's coming out you know it came out and everybody know now but at the time we was angry we put our work in and 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 here it is people coming out that we didn't even know of well i think you know it it was a slap in the face it was a slap in the face it's like somebody say you you in your house creating something and you let some company in and they're like wow that's so dope what you creating oh wow and then they leave and then um, and then a month later you see it it's being talked about all over TV and you're like and and it's, they're the ones that's doing it and you're like they came in my house and took my and they and they and they that's how you felt that's how you felt because we 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 put our work in and then i guess people when it became mainstream even now sequence is the first female rap group on wax they were not from the bronx they was from south carolina and she brought them up here and i guess her writing team maybe it was cast or somebody who wrote whatever so that's on wax but see sometimes when if you don't know where you came from you don't know where you're going and even though hip hop was a billion dollar industry and all that there's a lot of confusion going on in hip hop a lot of things that was happening in hip hop and and hip hop was kind of getting lost in the source people are just now really finding out about that oh i had some people i did the college tour carnegie university put my book in a rare um, archives vault of rare books and that was like amazing to me like like wow and um i did um fordham road in the um colleges when my book out came out and a lot of professors told me they was going to spain and stuff and they was quoting stuff from my book I felt like a million bucks to me that was like amazing but you'd be surprised when I would do these tours and talk to these kids and they'd be like they didn't even know it was of all they didn't never know it was female or all female group it was like it was females what it was a female group and you're like wow but that's because a lot of times when the men had that form they was not it was no concentrating on the females it was about them At the time Vibe and Kenston was merging. They did um Murder um book, then they did Biggie Smalls book. And then I said, "Hey, I always wrote about our journey. Why don't y'all check it out?" And Rob Kenner was the executive uh, editor, and Mimi Valdez and them was running it at the time. So they had to Biggie Smalls and I was like, so they was like, "Well, we got to take it to the boss Kenar Gibbs cuz he was running Vibe magazine." And so when he they took it to him on um, Rob's said he loves it they love it and um they said when are you going to finish it and i was like i was like i didn't go to college for writing i know how to write rhymes but i don't want to write a book they said but what you wrote is dope i said don't you have people that write right so i'll tell the story continue it nigga they said nah the way you wrote the story you're going to write the story and that's how my book came about because they right after biggie smalls then they published my book and then that's how my book came out right I got, but i didn't know, know i got caught in the middle of a thing because kenniston had found out by the magazine was getting me sell was selling their magazine i got caught in that i was already signed so they had to honor the contract so what they did was gave me a 10,000 bonus kenniston and 
they only put out enough copies to put their ten thousand to get their ten thousand dollars back. And so it was no push for the book, and it was just people that did read it was like, this is an amazing book. Are you kidding me? And it was like, I didn't know what to do. And the book is being sold, but it's third party merchants getting the money because no more books are being printed. And so when I, I'm, I don't know, you know, I'm part of the HBO Max special, mm -hmm. um, Max. So when I came out, the book was just, people was like, your book is selling for $200. The book is selling for $80, the book. And then a friend of mine, um, who used to be Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, uh, I used to go with Hyde, who was Alonzo Brown. And he's in the beginning of my book as my first boyfriend that I used to run away from. But he called me and he's like, I'm so pissed. Your book is amazing. And you're not making a dime and other people's eating off of your off of your book. And then he says, well, maybe you should change the cover or try to, you know, come out with something. And I was like, I, I, I even called a lawyer, like, how can I stop? They're getting the money and I'm not getting a dime. So people thinking I'm getting all this money off the book, I'm not getting a dime off of it. And um, that's why um, when I, with HBO Max with that film, um, uh, Ryan, he, he um, was, who was the um, one that is the, um, what do you call that? He's the one that organized everything. The name is in my head, the publicist. And he said, you know what, Sherry, you know, I'm, you could, if you want to change the cover of your book, um, I got my, this friend and we're just going to put it out on Kindle Audio. And so when maybe when people see the original cover of my book is so fly, I had a graffiti artist do that. And everybody's like, I want to, the thing is, but people like, they want that authentic one. And it's, and, and it's like, I don't even know how to get that printed up. And so, so even though it's on Kindle and that it's only for $9.99, people actually are still buying the other one because of the authenticity of the cover. My single is getting is being released in February. Oh, they wow. wanted me to come and hit the mic again, and I, I did it, and um, it's being mixed as we talk, and they're just gonna put it out in February, and they was like, why not? I mean, you're a legend, and imagine a legend coming out with a hit. I was like, there you go.